Welcome back to another screencast in which we're going to use what we learned about integer divisibility in the previous screencast and prove something with it. That's the main heart of this course is proof and communication and now we're going to prove things involving divisibility. Namely this conjecture here which is really a fact. It's going to be a true statement, a theorem. Uh, it's a property of divisibility that is similar to many of the ones that you see in the section in the Sundstrom textbook. Also something you probably picked up along the way in your school math career. It says that if A, B, C, and D are integers such that a divides C and B divides D. Remember that's how you read that symbol. This isn't a fraction. This isn't the fraction A over C or any such thing. It's a sentence. A divides C. It's a statement. And B divides D. If all that takes place then A times B divides C times D. Now before we begin a proof we need to just take a moment to check and uh, make sure that the conjecture is true and that we believe that it's true. So let's just pick some A's and B's here. A and B can, we're free to choose what we want. Let's just pick 3 and let's say 5 for fun. Let's keep it simple. And then uh, C and D can't be any integers. They need to be such that A divides C and B divides D. So remember what this means is that C is an integer multiple of A. There is some integer Q such that C is equal to A times Q. So let's pick an integer multiple of 3. Let's say just 27 for example, 9 times 3, and let's pick an integer multiple of 5, let's say 10, 2 times 5. Now, does the conclusion follow? Is a, B, uh, does AB divide CD? Well, AB is obviously 15, and CD is obviously 270. So the question is, does AB divide CD? And of course the answer is yes, and you'll find that. And how do we know? Uh, we could do long division, or we could use sort of our definition. Can you fill in the blank here with an integer? And the answer is yeah, use 18, for example. Uh, you might notice that the 18 is 9 times 2, and we use 9 to get from A to C, and 2 to get from B to D. So maybe it has something to do with what integer goes in the blank here. Okay, so maybe you need a couple more run-throughs of testing, use some different kinds of integers like negative integers and so forth, but let's let's assume that we believe this conjecture is true and now we're psychologically capable of moving on to a proof. Now I've got a blank no-show table uh, set up over here and again this is a conditional statement, okay, it's an if-then statement. Um, the only way we know so far how to prove such a thing is directly, so what we're going to do is uh, step through this no-show table starting with by assuming the hypothesis and ending with the conclusion and then the proof, the argument, is going to fill in the middle here. So what we know here is by assuming the hypothesis, I know that A, B, C, and D are integers, and I'm just going to shorthand that uh, like so using our set notation. A, B, C, and D are integers, and A divides C, and B divides D, and again the reason for that is that's the hypothesis. We always start a direct proof by assuming the hypothesis. The conclusion uh, at the end of this uh, proof is going to say that A, B divides uh, C, D. We don't know the reason for that yet. We will fill that in as we go. Okay, so we've got a bracket around this proof here. Let's move uh, either forward or backward. And perhaps it's easier to move forward first. What does it mean to say that A divides C and that B divides D? That's the essence of a forward step. Take what you already know and rephrase it by just interpreting what it means. Well, to say that A divides C means that there exists an integer, let's call it Q1, Okay, using some shorthand, again this means there exists an integer q1, uh, it's in the integers, <clears throat> such that, I'll abbreviate such that with an st, there exists an integer q1 such that c is equal to, is equal to a times q1, that is just using the definition of divides, okay, just like we did in the test, uh, how did I know that 3 divides 27, well 27 is equal to some integer multiple of 3, and so the definition gives us that. And we can also say the same thing for B, and there exists an integer, now we need it to be something different, we don't know, just like in the test, the, the integers, the, the quotients for the test cases we use were different, so I don't want to use the same letter here, uh, let's call it Q2 in the integers, such that D is equal to B times Q2, and again, that is by, both of these are by the definition of divides. That's by definition. Okay. The only way you could disagree with that step is to say that I think divides means something different than what you think it means. If we agree on the definitions, there's no way you can deny this step. So there exists, to say that A divides C means there exists an integer Q1 such that C equals AQ1, and to say B divides D is something similar, but I want to make sure I'm using different Qs here. I don't 
really mean for them to be the same quotient necessarily. Okay, now what can we do? Well, it's kind of hard to know. Let's move down to the bottom end of the proof here, maybe work backwards, because uh, it's a similar case. When, it, when I say that AB divides CD, which I don't know yet, but what does this statement mean? And that's the essence of a backwards step, too. It would mean that there would have to exist an integer, let's call it Q3, such that uh, CD, the thing being divided, is equal to ABQ3. Okay, so the very, very last line is going to be true by definition as well. I'll just abbreviate it, definition of divides. And that's, this, is what it, this is what it means. Now, maybe this gives us an idea how to get from here to here. I want to eventually end up saying something about C times D. So why don't I go up here to P1 and actually calculate C times D. This gives me an inroad to making a forward step. I'm going to say, what is C times D anyway? Well, uh, C is equal to AQ1. So let me just substitute AQ1 in for C and then substitute BQ2 in for D. Okay, and this, what I just did there was I substituted, did two substitutions, this for C and this for D, and that was established in line P1. Now what I can do next is a little bit of uh, arithmetic here, or algebra if you like, and that is to shuffle some things around. And remember down here in line Q1 where I eventually want to end is uh, on the right side of that equation is A times B times something. So I'm just going to manipulate the ordering of multiplication here and commute things around. So A times B times the quantity Q1 times Q2. And that is by algebra, or if what specifically I did here, algebra, was the commutative property to change the ordering of multiplication, and that's okay, and the associative property to group off the Q1 and Q2. Now, why did I group off the Q1 and the Q2? Well, just notice that I'm very close to the end here. I have CD equals AB times something, and that's exactly where I wanted to end up. I need to end up saying that CD equals a multiple of AB, and that's exactly how I've written it. Just in case this is somehow not clear, this is a C right here and an A right here. Now, what's left is to say that the thing that I'm multiplying by, the Q3, really is an integer, right? This can't just be AB times anything. It's got to be AB times an integer, right? has to be in the integer. So what I need to do next is this all important but easy to miss step that the thing I have right here is truly an integer. So I'm just going to make that assertion. Uh, Q1 and Q not and, Q1 times Q2 is an integer. Now why is that? Uh, it's by closure. It's by the closure property of the integers under multiplication because Q1 is an integer. We saw that up here and so was Q2. And I'm just saying that when I take two integers and multiply them together I get a third integer. Okay, so now the only thing left in this no-show table is to fill in the reason right here. So what's that going to be? Well, how do I get to the definition uh, from the previous lines? Basically, I needed to say what the Q3 is. Uh, what is the Q3? Uh, Q3 is the simply Q1 times Q2. Uh, that's my Q3. That's my my uh, quotient that I'm going to be using to set up the definition of divisibility which gets me to the end. So there's a completed no-show table using the definition of divisibility. Notice that in a no-show table any given point, especially at the beginning, at the top end of the proof and at the bottom end, involves interpreting rephrasing things and many times that's using definitions of things. So instantiating that definition of divisibility is super important. Thank you for watching.